Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. He is back, um, and today we are interviewing Edward Evanson, uh, head of business development at Brains, uh, a Bitcoin uh, mining company uh, known for the world's first Bitcoin mining pool uh, slush pool. Um, so, Edward, I know you had uh, COVID uh, not long ago. Uh, how are you feeling now? You all recovered? Yeah, um, you must uh, you must follow my Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling much much better now. It hit me pretty hard for like two to three days but after that i was fine just staying inside until it was officially negative and now life's back to normal all good gotcha nice glad to hear it yeah i had it over christmas so i know the same feeling of like being stuck there you feel like you're in a box very aggravating but uh good to hear you're all good um and yeah thanks for coming on i um i guess first question to kick us off uh when it comes to uh, you and uh, Bitcoin. What is your what's your kind of uh, origin story? What were you doing before Bitcoin, and how did you find it? And then, like, what was it about Bitcoin that kind of uh, appealed to you? Like, because obviously different things for different people. Yeah, for sure. Um, so before Bitcoin, um, I was getting my I was a PhD student in uh, history with a focus on economics, um, history of money, uh, international markets. Um, lecturing some courses, uh, being a TA in some courses, things like that, as well as doing their own research and courses. And uh, naturally, because of those topics, I was already interested in um, something like Bitcoin. This new form of money had appeared, and it was always something that interested me. Um, I think when I first heard about it, it was from a friend in undergrad in like 2012, but I didn't really look much into it at that point. I kind of just shrugged it off as like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> and um, I started getting like actually into it and researching it and figuring out what Bitcoin was all about um, in 2016. And then I, at that time, late 2016, realized that I didn't want to be a professor, which is what I thought my, the original track I was on. And so I dropped out and moved to China. And from there, sort of dove, um, you know, full time into uh Bitcoin and the Bitcoin mining world um, uh, was working in China for about two and a half, three years based out of uh, Shanghai and Beijing. And then I moved to um, Prague in 2019 and started with brains then. So I've been, in, uh, I guess, in Bitcoin for uh, coming up on six years here almost or five and some change. But um, uh, I haven't been in Prague until 2019. So that's kind of how I got into it. Just some already uh, was already interested in these topics. And uh, once it was kind of was placed in front of me in a more direct manner, I kind of just fell down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I was going to say, um, the situation with like uh, being a professor and then um, deciding not to do it. I know someone who's going through the same thing. I get, so you had you, did you like decide to just leave it and just jump to China on a whim or was it more like you got like a role in Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin or I'm trying to work out what came first you know like was it oh yeah Bitcoin kind of started to take over as a thing and you realize you want to get involved then you head off to China or was it more like screw this I'm going on a find myself journey and then you ended up being like oh well I can do this anyway <laughs> um so I guess the best way to describe it is they kind of happened simultaneously, but I didn't, I didn't move to China specifically for Bitcoin related stuff. Um, I wish I had some grand plan that was executed perfectly, but I knew I was moving to China like three weeks before I actually did. Um, I had visited once before and then a friend and former roommate of mine at the time, who was my roommate in uh, undergrad some years before was already living in Shanghai. He said, come check out China in Shanghai. So I packed up my stuff. And then went over. It was uh, pretty simple. Nothing too planned. Were you involved in the famous Chinese mining uh, industry while you were in China? Or did you get involved in mining afterwards, like when you went to Prague? Uh, while I was in China. Uh, mostly while I was in Beijing. Um, I worked at uh, F2 Pool when I was in Beijing. That's pretty interesting. It's like a, it's an interesting story. And I think um, like heading to China, it's, it's got to be a bit of a culture shock. Um uh, it, I imagine it's very different to the to the US uh, where you were studying and, and, and 
living. <laughs> um, I imagine anyway. Um, never been to China myself. Uh, I suppose when it comes to like, um, so you've experienced uh, mining in China and obviously now in uh, Czech Republic or Czech, I think I'm supposed to say. Um, what what are like the main, because something I've always been interested in is like what, what are the main things that people who are mining and and I suppose yeah anyone who's mining on like a sort of grand scale what are the what are the main challenges that they're facing because I I it's, it's kind of like a side of the world that I just don't really think about too much like I know how you mine I know how someone can set up their own like mining rig but like how how what are the actual issues that that these people are facing on a day to day basis because it's something that interests me is like what are the problems is it is it like cooling issues or what are the general things that you know people on the day to day are, are, are maintaining these yeah, so that's that's a pretty big question, and um, the main problems are going to differ depending on the kind of setup that they have, where they're mining, whether they're doing air cooled or immersion, the scale they're mining on, um, what the market is like at the time. You know, the problems miners faced a couple of years ago are very different than the problems they're generally facing today. So, in the short term, um, a big issue uh, the industry as a whole seem to be facing is. Um, Actually, maybe we can start with one that actually has sort of plagued the industry, you could say, for a long time now, and uh, kind of a bottleneck. Um, one of the more centralized parts of Bitcoin mining would be the hardware manufacturers. So basically, you're relying on, for the most part, two entities to supply you with uh, your Bitcoin mining devices, the biggest one being Bitmain and the second one being MicroBT. Um, so they have a lot of leverage and power, I guess, in negotiations between uh, themselves and their clients and um, basically are able to dictate prices and don't have a whole lot of competition. This is going to change um, in 2022 and 2023. Uh, it's, you know, there's a recent public announcement that Intel is getting into Bitcoin mining chips and they've already selected some, uh, some partners to be sort of the, uh, to receive the first batches of them. And um, so it's interesting that there's now a US chip producer throwing their hat into the ring and participating. And there are also some other miners that are mining at a scale of like hundreds of megawatts that are either buying chips from different sources or designing their own to create um, their own special mining setups. And so that they don't necessarily have to rely on one or two companies for their entire business, which is pretty untenable for any other industry, um, but that they, they are now mining on such a scale that it makes more sense to just start producing their own mining devices and not uh, for distribution or for sale, but just for their own operations. Um, so they get uh, basically the cost base is much lower. So, you know, maybe they're spending uh, 20 bucks per tera hash on their hash rate, as opposed to, you know, between 80 to hundred dollars per tera hash when you're trying to procure uh, machines from Bitmain or something right now. So um, that's something that's, uh, you know, the fact that there's only a, a few large suppliers of these Bitcoin mining devices has been an issue that miners, any miner will face, large or small. Um, more recently, there's some uh, chip shortages from the foundries where Bitmain and MicroBT procure the ASIC chips for their devices and the space for these uh, in these foundries to reserve chip production is becoming more and more scarce and a lot more people are kind of vying for it. So now uh, they have to compete more uh, pretty seriously with entities like Apple, um, car manufacturers, things like that, that are all hungry for, for chip production and trying to secure um, their supply for the years to come. Um, and then uh, I could go on for hours about just like the day-to-day -day operational challenges that different mining operations face. Um, you know, there's always delays in terms of like build outs to the infrastructure. And uh, because of the, China Chinese ban on mining back in summer of last year. Now, um, the a dynamic of the industry sort of flipped, whereas before there was kind of an overabundance of hosting space for miners. And so uh, hosting providers didn't necessarily enjoy the most favorable terms with their contracts with different miners who were hosting machines in their facilities. Um, but ever since the, the China ban, you know, uh, 40 to 50% of the network shut off at the time. And then you have this huge outflow of machines and um, there's all of a sudden it, it flipped and now there's an over demand for uh, the rack space. And people were still in the uh, you know early stages of large build outs to expand their capacity. So then they began to enjoy a much better position in the market now commanding things like profit share agreements, higher 
uh, prices per kilowatt hour. And um, so a, a challenge that miners have been facing the last, you know, two to three quarters uh, now is basically getting machines, but not necessarily having the space to put them on the shelf and turn them on. And so uh, a lot of it's kind of waiting for this new capacity to come on in places like uh, Texas, which is becoming increasingly popular in places like Paraguay, which has now a bunch of uh, abundant hydropower that can be used for Bitcoin mining. Argentina is heating up. Uh, Venezuela has always been a place for old gen machines to kind of travel to when other larger miners uh, replace their older generation machines with some of the newer, uh, newer generation ones. And so then they would sell these and eventually as they get old enough, they all kind of make their way to the dirt cheap electricity rates um, that you can find there. Uh, Kazakhstan started expanding. So yeah, that's kind of at, at the risk of uh, just going on forever rambling. I'll just cut it off there, but large and small people face many different challenges um, on the day to day. No, I appreciate that. Um, that kind of answers my question pretty well um and i've got bad signals so sorry if, you, if i do cut out again but um i saw about the kazakhstan situation uh where they have um uh what's it, big protests and like uh, shutdowns of the internet and electricity and all sorts of things like that it feels like with mining miners are almost playing a game of cat and mouse a lot of the time like chasing the cheap electricity but also trying to get away from instability and uh, governments that aren't a fan of them and so like the things like um, the Kazakhstan issue and then things like I think it's the EU is talking about the regulators talking about trying to ban uh, crypto mining in general although I think they're mainly talking about Bitcoin mining and proof of work um, these kinds of things I guess is there like obviously you're someone in the mining industry is there is there concern I guess around this like with a lot of mining companies or are they more so kind of happy like yeah look we're in Texas we're going to be good or we're in Venezuela we'll just keep going after the, the the good the good or the sources of electricity i think it's like is it something that generally seems to concern these, these people who are, who are doing the mining or is it not really a big deal to them when they hear this stuff about like the eu and and then the Kazakhstan? i think it's something that's always in the back of their minds um naturally when you know heads of state or people in political power are speaking about you know creating a moratorium or a ban on your industry it's going to concern you to some extent um, however, it's about assessing different risk profiles, just like with any other investment. Um, the, you know, if, you, if you're going to a place like Kazakhstan, like Venezuela, or some of these places where uh, authority is, you know, arguably more dictatorial and centralized, and things can change at the drop of a hat, um, you're going to weigh that trade off with the cheaper electricity prices in these places. Um, however, this, you know, for people with low risk appetites, this is one of the reasons why Canada and the United States are so attractive because generally they've always had a pretty stable regulatory environment. You can see things coming from very far out and you can thus try to intervene and protect your own interests um, in the legislative process. And then also the United States, a lot of people seem to overlook this, um, have the advantage of it being a set of United States, right? So you have the federal government and then the local state governments and in places like Texas, Wyoming, Ohio, Kentucky, you already have a significant amount of investment and job creation in those areas from Bitcoin mining. You have the governor, Governor Abbott of Texas, um, kind of fully on board to Bitcoin mining as a growing industry within Texas borders. And, you know, when you create this level of investment, new jobs, and you can see how quickly the industry going is, is growing, and you can demonstrate to these uh, political representatives in the region that you know, there's, there's a lot more potential growth to come and benefits to the state, then um, you have people in your corner, you have people on your side, you have uh, senators like Loomis, um, you have, uh, um, say, Abbott, there's, I um, can't, can't remember her last name, I think it's Caitlin Long, um, who is now, I think, left her office seat and gone to a, a private, like, uh, cryptocurrency bank in Wyoming. And these are now uh, Brian Brooks, who is now working for, for Bitfury as the CEO in the US. So you, you have uh, now a, a set of people who are politically skilled in terms of like knowing the right channels and avenues and how to lobby for um, these interests uh, before congressional hearings, um, state hearings, what have you. So it's a longer process and there's uh, open avenues that you can use to kind of protect Bitcoin mining. There's not as much of a risk of just, you know, uh, Congress stepping in and saying, hey, we're doing a 
federal ban on Bitcoin mining. Um, it's not nearly as as easy to pull off as other uh, states like in Kazakhstan, where um, people can essentially decide something one day and it comes into reality the next. We recently interviewed Ricardo Frega, the host of the Bitcoin Italia podcast, and he visited the volcano mining operation that's in El Salvador. And he actually spoke to the technicians working at the geothermal energy plant and asked them their opinion on Bitcoin mining um, in light of the, the narrative that uh, Bitcoin mining is like using up all the world's resources and stuff. And those technicians seem to be super excited about the prospect of being able to harvest and store this energy with Bitcoin. And, and they claim it's going to revolutionize energy for like the next hundred years. Um, what's your opinion on the, on this, um, this narrative that Bitcoin's going to boil the oceans and all that? Uh, it's just patently false and just ridiculous. And to the largest degree, um, you know, there were some articles coming out in 2017. I think it was from Newsweek, it was originally, or um, I can't remember the exact source, but they were saying that basically now in 2022, that Bitcoin would be consuming the, all of the world's energy, um, you know, boiling the oceans meme. And we can see that that's not the case. It consumes, um, I think it's like it's 0.2, 0.25 or something percent of like global electricity consumption. And people, Something I really don't like about the narrative, this like sort of uh, environmentalist, like anti-Bitcoin approach, is that uh, everyone talks about it in terms of energy consumption, as if energy consumption is the same as emissions. It's just not the case at all. Uh, before the Chinese ban on Bitcoin mining, the vast, vast majority of the hash rate for the majority of the year was coming out of Sichuan, and they were taking advantage of hydropower. Um, sure, Xinjiang, of course, if you're just being honest, like they use coal power up in the north, but for the majority of the year, most of the hash rate was coming out of Sichuan. And they have an overabundance of hydropower there because they've built up so many hydro um, uh, plants around these rivers and dams. And a lot of these things aren't even actually near population centers. So they're just, they just go to waste. There's, there's all this accessible energy that's not being used. It's renewable and it's cheap. So they were, being, they were taking advantage of sources like that. And even since China has banned it, right? Um, a lot of the sources you look at in the U.S. are hydro, as in Canada as well. Um, you have, uh, you know, these um, off-grid mining operations that reduce um, gas venting and oil flaring, uh, where you know the efficiency can be as low as thirty percent, and actually, you know, reducing that CO two that comes out of some of these flares. And instead of like flaring all this stuff or like venting it to the atmosphere, uh, you can plop down a generator next to it converted it into electricity and mine Bitcoin with it, you reduce emissions significantly uh, and you are able to take advantage of energy that's already available, um, but can't be transported anywhere effectively. That is stranded energy. Um, you know, when you look at the, some of the research that's coming out from the Cambridge Institute of Alternative Finance, um, you know, some of the stuff the, the Bitcoin Mining Council is doing in, in North America in terms of disclosing their energy mix, uh, the new projects that are coming up, like the the, one, the world's like largest hydro dam in Paraguay. It, I think it has like 14 gigawatt capacity. Most of it's sent to Brazil, um, but uh, there's still, I think, like 20 to 30 percent available for Paraguay. Um, you know, the, the energy mix of, of Bitcoin mining is more green than any other in, uh, industry that I can think of off the top of my head. And it, it just also, like on a final note, so I don't go on too long, it all just seems so hypocritical, right? Like Bitcoin mining doesn't happen in a vacuum. You should compare it like relative to other industries. You know, where is this Where is this uprising about gold mining? Like where's where is the, the shouting about the lithium uh, mining that like, you know, Tesla is, is subsidizing so much for its car batteries. That is literally the most destructive form of mining. And, um, you know, where's the, the, the outcry of like the, the solar panels coming out of China that uses like Uyghur labor. I, I don't, um, it just seems so hypocritical, uh, misinformed and just patently false in many cases. So that's basically what I think of the boils of the ocean. Uh, narrative, and I think it's going to be a um, really important moving forward, especially in the next couple of years, to push back against some of these regulatory proposals to uh, to like basically shut down proof of work as much as possible, and do it with data, um, do it with the truth, do it with you know disclosures of energy mixes, um, good research that shows that 
this this narrative that mainstream media outlets are pushing is um in the nicest way to put bullshit edward so um one of the biggest um criticisms of um bitcoin mining has to be that uh, it's centralized especially when um we have this criticism from the bitcoin maxis that you know proof of stake is not going to work especially with the uh, anticipation of um ethereum's proof of stake um uh mining you know thing and you know we say you know proof of stake is doomed to fail because you know most of the ethereum people already have most of the coins so it's obviously going to centralize you know before it's doomed to fail and they the ethereum people have this kind of gotcha saying you know you know bitcoin mining centralized the barrier to entry is too high and um i kind of see the merit to the argument so what's your opinion i've you know heard different arguments you know regarding that you know um that this argument so i want to get your opinion on that i mean i would just like bluntly disagree with the the statement that bitcoin mining is is centralized um when you look at uh distribution of hash rate uh, across the world um and using sources like i mentioned before the cambridge institute of alternative finance um some of these larger like data collecting organizations that then put that data out in uh more digestible ways and charts and visualize it and whatnot uh you can see that um especially since the the ban from china on bitcoin mining has become more distributed and decentralized you have massive amounts of hash rate scattered across south america um you have a definitely a significant increase in concentration of hash rate in north america specifically the united states but uh there's still a ton in northern kazakhstan where the mining that got shut down in Kazakhstan was in southern Kazakhstan this in large part was due to the fact that the government was subsidizing the energy coming in and they didn't really see a reason to pay for people to bitcoin mine in their country um massive amounts of hash, hash rate in Russia um huge amounts of hash rate in Scandinavia you're starting to see it pop up in sub-saharan Africa um the UAE I was just at a, the Bitmain conference in November uh this last year in Dubai the UAE is getting huge into bitcoin mining and looking to invest massive amounts uh there's mining in Kuwait I, I could go on forever the the um hash rate is distributed across the globe amongst many many different entities all with an interest in protecting the bitcoin network and thus their 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 investment securing it I should say and that that's an important point to make as well they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart they're doing it um due to the financial incentives which were put intentionally in place to facilitate this system. Um so if someone were to come to me and say uh, bitcoin mining is centralized, I would just ask them to be more specific because I don't really I wouldn't really know what they mean by that because hash rate is so globally distributed. Um I mean there's even huge amounts of hash rate in Iran. Uh it I I just honestly I uh I would be very confused if someone came to me and said bitcoin mining is centralized because to me that would just seem that they hadn't done a cursory google search because like a, a simple google search would come up with data showing you that that's not the case. So um I get what you mean. Um uh, that um you know there's there's obviously lots of players across you know the world that are involved in bitcoin mining globally. What what about the high barrier to entry that you know for it to actually become a profitable miner you have to you know join a mining pool and basically the mining pool to take you know dictates you know you know the mining pool as a large corporation basically dictates um the you know the rules of the game and along with like alongside with you know other miners and when you compare to proof of stake you know when you when if you accumulate enough coins then you can become i think a delegator in the ethereum proof of stake um, ecosystem do you not see how it compares and kind of makes us a bit you know hypocritical seeing that although you might say you know they scooped up coins early but these people got into mining early and the barrier to mining you know to bitcoin mining is still fairly high mm. so i think maybe that's uh a more recent criticism the barrier to entry side because you know if you look at the market in 2020 uh you could pick up used machines like Estines for example for 20 to 30 bucks a piece it's not a very high entry uh a barrier of entry into mining of course uh as the price of BTC has skyrocketed since then and mining economics has also reflected that being more profitable naturally the the equipment that lets you mine is going to rise in price as well in fact i think Estines 
ant miner estimates outperformed the price of Bitcoin uh, in 2021. So um, I would challenge that, especially in comparison to proof of stake for a couple of reasons. Uh, when you look at the, the amount of coins you would have to buy on a proof of stake network to become a delegator like Ethereum, that is extremely expensive as well. I think, what is it like 32 ETH? You would need to be a proof of stake delegator, which, you know, with $3,200 per ETH, it's not exactly a low barrier to entry. And as you also stated, the, the supply has been concentrated, like 90% of the supply has been concentrated in very few hands. Um, and lastly, it just replicates existing, I think, like oligarchical top-down systems. So it's nothing new. Um, but with, um, I think some recent trends in Bitcoin mining have actually uh, demonstrated that there really isn't too high of a barrier to entry to get in because what we've seen uh, over the course of 2021 is a huge kind of at home miner power to the plebs movement. And you have even uh, many companies now popping up where their main clientele is to sell miners to retail and they offer them several options. They can either, um, you know, host their machines in one of their partners facilities so they can get access to cheaper electricity rates so that they can mine profitably, or they can simply buy the machines and have them shipped to their house. And you can see people mining. I mean, if you just go on any social media platform and look for it, you can see thousands and thousands of people mining from home profitably, especially with the newer gen machines that are more efficient than some of the older ones. And I will also say that I know we brought up Venezuela earlier. Um, the vast, vast, vast majority of the hash rate in Venezuela isn't coming from these like large institutions uh, that have, you know, 100 megawatt data centers. They're, they're at home miners. They're people that have one to five devices in their basement because their currency is worthless. And this is how they preserve their wealth and actually make a living for themselves and their family. So um, I think to make a statement like Bitcoin mining has too high of a barrier of, of entry um, means you probably have some blinders on and you're only looking at like the most new machine that's most recently come out that of course is going to command the highest price like you know ten thousand dollars per device you're not looking at some of the used hardware that you can get a hold of and still mine profitably um and of course you know anyone's going to have challenges as they scale up getting into it but i wouldn't say it's any more difficult than building a business or investing in really any other industry um i think maybe some of that comes from the fact that you know uh if you're a single retail miner, you can't just spin up a petahash at the snap of your fingers without putting a decent amount of money into it and finding a place to actually put those machines would probably be difficult for a smaller miner like that. Um, but in in the grand scheme of things, I wouldn't say it's that difficult at all. There's many avenues to pursue for this. You mentioned that there's two major um, mining machine manufacturers, but I've heard of other manufacturers as well. Do people actually buy or do they still produce miners or? or... Why do you only say that there's only two manufacturers? Um, so there are other mining devices, whether they be, whether it's GPU mining or ASICs for other networks like Zcash that are available. Of course, most of those are made by Bitmain as well. But um, uh, the reason why I only mentioned those two is because, you know, uh, in practice, if you have some investment and you're looking to spin up a, a decently sized Bitcoin mining operation, you essentially inevitably are going to have to interact with those two entities and whether it's short term and maybe you don't go with the deal with them and you go with Kanan or something, but um, pretty much anyone who gets into Bitcoin mining touches Bitmain or micro BT at some point and they dwarf the size of any of their competition. Hopefully uh, Intel is going to change that. Um, I suppose when it comes to the, this uh, centralization criticism uh, that Jerry mentioned, uh, uh, from my Thoughts, I guess, wouldn't it come? I guess, wouldn't it come from the fact that because obviously you can have um, miners in different geographical areas, but if they all are members of one pool, then obviously there's some elements of centralization there. So I, I know that in the past, I, I could be wrong here, uh, correct me if I am, but in the past, I remember there was a mining pool that split into two because there was a concern that they were going to have there was it was going to be too centralized. I might be wrong. I, I, maybe I'm just imagining this, but I thought that did happen uh, like a while back. So I guess that's where some of the criticism comes from. Uh, I'm not really going to ask you a question about that because obviously it's pretty straightforward. We have different pools and uh, if any of them get too large, they'll probably split into two, just like uh, like I described. Um, I guess my question for you, 
something I, I find quite interesting is how different mining pools uh, distribute rewards. Um, oh, I can froze a little bit there, but yeah, how they distribute, how they distribute rewards. So um, when it comes to slush pool, uh, how do you guys distribute rewards uh, and amongst the miners, but also like how is that adapted and changed? Because obviously 2010, right? It's been over a decade. So like how, I assume it was much more simple in the early days. Like how has that changed and, and why? Like it'd just be interesting to find out about that. Yeah, so just like a quick sentence on the first thing you mentioned. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, I don't know sure if it's split or just closed down. I think you're referring to GHash pool back in like 2014. Um, but I think that's just another example of uh, how miners react and like when a threat like that is posed, it, it's in everyone's best interest to not completely destroy the network they're all profiting from. But uh, two, I will say before moving on is the cost to switch pools um, is basically zero in like, you can switch all your hash rate over in like 20 minutes to another pool. Um, and it's not gonna really cost you anything and pools are extremely competitive with one another. And so you'll probably get a, the same or cheaper rate. And um, also it's important to note that there are like, you know, maybe 15, 20 major mining pools. And then, uh, you know, if they were to act in a bad, if someone were to get, first they would have to get more than 50% of the network hash rate. And then they would have to um, be silly enough to attack the network, thus destroying their whole business and incentives and this whole thing they've built up over the years. Um, and if there was any chance of that happening, you would just see hash rate move from that pool immediately to other ones. They would no longer be able to do that. Um, in terms of your uh, the, the payouts question in regards to slush pool, it's actually the same payouts we've done uh, since 2010. It's called the we call it score scoring system. And uh, basically you, um, you point your machines at a uh, our stratum. You have a pool account where these machines as workers are attached to. And um, when the pool finds a block, it then uh, evaluates your score, basically how your average hash rate over a specific period of time. And then based on that score, it distributes a reward to you from that block proportional to your contribution to the pool. So if you, to make it simple, if you contribute 10% of the pool's hash rate, you will, you will receive 10% of that block's reward um, minus a small fee um, for, for the service. So um, it's actually unique in that we were the only pool that actually has this payout mechanism. Um, one of its advantages is you don't ever really need to worry where the coins are coming from because they go directly from the Coinbase subsidy with transaction fees to slash pool wallet to your wallet. Um, so it's based like the shortest transaction history you can really have unless you've solo mined. Um, and yeah, it, it hasn't changed, I guess, is the short answer to that question. Oh, that's interesting because I um, I guess like in, in theory, what I'm thinking here, which I feel like in practice isn't going to work, but you can tell me. In theory, I'm thinking like, hey, if I'm a miner, say I could... Um, yeah, I feel like this is going to work, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I could be a part of Slash Pool, and then obviously I could gain from the rewards. Um, but then if my specific machine mines a block, could I not then somehow lie and say, oh, I, 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 I'm just trying to think, like, is there a way that someone could gain the system? Like, obviously, they could uh, be a part of your pool and then maybe change over to another pool just before they happen to mine a block uh, on you know, on, on, I'm, just, I'm trying to think of a way that essentially there's a weakness, but I guess, um, is there anything that stands out as like a glaring weakness in, in, in practice uh, like that? Have you, have you come across any people trying to actually gamify and, and sort of like abuse the system or has it generally been quite straightforward? Uh, it's very straightforward because effectively the pool becomes the miner, right? So, and, and there's no way to determine that you're about to mine a block. So you wouldn't be able to like switch off. You only know once you've actually mined it. Um, and you, know, you can check, you can look at the, the GUI of your miner and there's a place that's under blocks found and you can usually, it's like a one there. I've never seen one that says two, um, but uh, uh, so you can, you know, celebrate. It's like a nice Easter egg. Yay, my, my miner was the one that found the block, but it is always distributed to all miners on the pool. Um, otherwise the uh, incentives to join a pool would probably crumble very quickly. If someone had figured out a way to do that, um, it would probably be very chaotic, just pure chaos right now. Because I, I feel like, um, I think what I was thinking in my head was like, you, you, your miner specifically would get a block and then you wouldn't declare it to the pool. But obviously what you're saying is that's not necessarily possible anyway. So 
I appreciate no, that. The, the pool finds the block and then it also uh, it signs the blocks they find. Most do anyways. So for every block that slush pool mines, you can look at the Coinbase tag and it'll say slush pool or mined by slush pool. Um, you probably don't have information on like other mining pools, but for slush pool, like how many miners would you estimate are like combining their, their hash power to create slush pools hash power? Uh, actually, you can see that on our dashboard. Um, so let me, it changes throughout the day, you know, as people, some people are doing maintenance, some people turn on and off their machines for other reasons, like if they're on load balancing grid programs, things like that. So if I go to the dashboard here, system statistics, Bitcoin, uh, it's about 180,000 devices on slush pool right now. It's a pretty, uh, pretty good size. What's the, do you know what the biggest, well, do you know what the biggest mining pool is at the moment? Uh, I believe at the moment it's Foundry. Uh, besides like making, you know, like more powerful ASICs, like what are the other advances that, that are being made in the mining industry right now? I've heard of like Stratum version two and, and things of that nature. Could you kind of explain that to us? Yeah, so um, uh, Stratum V2 is a mining protocol, so it'd be on the software side. Um, Slush pool uh, was basically to, uh, as more and more people in the early days uh, plugged in miners and more and more hash rate came online to the network. There were some scaling issues because previously miners connected directly to uh, the Bitcoin daemon uh, for mining. And then pools came along and there was this sort of like open source Git work protocol, but it didn't necessarily scale well with the exponential increase in hash rate that kept coming online. So what Slushable did back in 2012 was uh, release Stratum V1 which is a pooled mining protocol. Also, we open sourced it. So uh, every single mining pool in existence today runs some form of implementation of Stratum V1. Um, it's always been kind of a big part of what we do as a company. It's uh, open source software for Bitcoin mining and in the open source Bitcoin core spirit. Um, and so Stratum V2 can be seen uh, as an upgrade to Stratum V1 because at the time in 2012, no one could have foreseen the Bitcoin network being where it is today. And uh, naturally, because of that, there needs to be some things uh, that are upgraded so that it can continue to scale um, you know, decades into the future. So you don't have to deal with problems down the line. Um, so basically the improvements for V2, uh, which is another brain's um, slush pool proposal is in there's increased security. Um, there's uh, more efficiency, sort of its data load transfers. And the third aspect, which is probably the one that's most talked about is referred to as job negotiation. And the idea behind job negotiation is to shift uh, power away from mining pools and put more of that back into the hand of the individual miners. Surprise, surprise, a pool is actually creating this initiative. Um, and what this allows, uh, right now, mining pools are the ones that submit the block templates. So they decide which transactions go in each block. And there's obviously an incentive to make sure um, you know, the highest value transaction fees are put into the block because that way there's a higher reward. They can distribute a higher reward to more miners. There's more of an incentive for miners to join their pool. So everyone's trying to get the highest uh, transaction fees to put into the next block. But instead of the pool just doing all this, what we uh, job negotiation does is allows uh, individual miners connected to Stratum V2 to submit their own block templates. So they can say, hey, this is my block template. Um, these are the set of transactions that I want to submit should the pool find a block. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's called negotiation for a reason. The pool can reject it, for example, but if the pool does reject it, they can then take that to another pool because one of the features in V2 is zero and backend switching. So you can pretty seamlessly and instantly switch between stratum URLs of different pools. Um, so that's kind of uh, the feature that most people talk about, which would allow miners to select the transaction sets themselves as opposed to relying on the pool to do so, which has all sorts of advantages. Um, so that's kind of the software, more open source Bitcoin mining infrastructure, it's a mining protocol. Um, and yeah, that answers your question. So that's one of the innovations coming into the space. Um, other ones, innovations do also revolve around hardware. They're not necessarily just more efficient chips, but, uh, some innovations in like immersion cooling to keep the chips cool so that you can uh, basically run these machines at higher frequencies, um, higher power limits, and thus produce more hash rate. 
Um, so that's becoming cheaper as like there's some innovations in coolant and the way they get set up because before they're really expensive to build. Now the cost of building them is coming down. Um, and then also the form factor of some of these devices. But yeah, um, those would be the, the hardware and software side are kind of the main things for mining right now. But it's pretty straightforward. And the, on the hardware side, I saw yesterday, I saw this or this morning. I can't remember now, but I saw, I think it's Bitmain is adding uh, liquid cooling to some of the miners or they're looking to add liquid cooling or something like that, which I thought was kind of interesting to see how um, that's adapting and changing right now. I guess there's a lot of buzz actually in the mining world because I keep seeing things about different companies investing in, like, I saw something about a Thai company investing in, 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 in mining companies. And obviously um, there's interest from Texas. So it seems like a, quite a hot industry um even things like did you see um on jordan peterson's podcast uh safety and, and, and the one thing that jordan peterson seemed the most interested in was mining and um, because he was like well actually i can understand how it's like a a way to transfer to sort of essentially get uh, otherwise wasted energy uh, and, and monetize it and so he was really excited about that aspect which i was quite impressed about um so there's a lot going on, uh, that's for sure. Uh, I expect you're probably pretty busy. I guess a question I should have asked you at the beginning of the podcast that I did not ask you um, that I'm interested in is, I guess, uh, for you, in your role as uh, doing BD at um, a mining company, what does that look like? Because um, I can't, like, I'm trying to think what all the different things you could be doing. But obviously, let me know, like, what, what, what do you do? What does your job look like? Yeah, for sure. Um, where to start? So uh, a lot of it is, you know, I speak to a lot of miners on a, a daily basis, figuring out what it is they want, what it is they need in terms of their, you know, firmware, the software that runs on these devices, because we make Brains OS Plus, which is a software that makes these machines mine more efficiently, more profitably, you know, what features they could possibly need. Um, so I'm in conversation with some miners, which has led to multiple features being added to uh, some of our products, which make them more attractive. So for example, the ERCOT system in Texas, which has the load balancing program to where you have to sometimes shut off miners very quickly and turn them back on throughout the day as different parts of the grid have more or less demand for energy. Um, this encouraged us to put like the quick start and pause feature into it so that people could actually operate within the parameters of this ERCOT program, which the stock uh, software from the manufacturers didn't necessarily let them do. So a lot of it's just like, market feedback and like allowing us to build better, more desirable products. Um, there's of course the, like the sales aspect to it of like doing things to bring over as much hash rate as possible to all your products, which is the name of the game in this industry, like increasing the hash rate under management. Um, uh, keeping for me personally, a lot of what I have to do is like try to build like long-term uh, uh, business relationships. So not necessarily everything short-term is like, hey, you have hash rate. I want your hash rate, bring it over to us, but more so finding where um, we could add value to various mining companies, which would then uh, solidify a relationship with them. We provide something that they need for their operations to go smoothly and profitably. And in exchange, you know, we scale up with them. Um, and there's all sorts of things. I mean, there's a couple irons in the fire I'm not actually allowed to talk about, but uh, most of it comes down to, um, you know, building better services and products for miners sharing information and, um, you know, public appearances. I'm doing uh, like presentations and stuff like Bitcoin 2021, uh, probably Bitcoin 2022. Uh, so all the various conferences around the world that are mining focused or like high profile Bitcoin ones. Um, a lot of stuff on podcasts like this one. Um, so that refill uh, the uh, like Tales from the Crypt, Marty Bent stuff. Um, crypto mining tool, there's been a whole list. Um, Max Kaiser's podcast with Jan. So also like making sure that everything basically that's growth focused, like growing the brand, uh, growing the revenue, um, setting up the revenue models for the new products, like the pricing scheme for Brains of Us and things like that. So it really stretches into a bunch of stuff, having to work with the product team, to deliver some of that market feedback between the miners that I mentioned before, having to work a lot with the marketing team for stuff like this, as well as these presentations um, that I mentioned before, um, working with some consulting team um, to connect them with the right people. Really, there's uh, you get pulled in every direction where you're needed. Okay. Yeah, Edward. Um, 
sometime last year, um, Sailor launched the uh, Bitcoin Mining Council, and I was going through their website, and I noticed that um, you guys are not in there. And you know, if you due to the uh, you know, yes, if you are probably not sure if you were then doing say with two X and all that hard fork, you know, um, uh, prices, and it, it left you know a sour taste in the mouth of you know Bitcoiners and made them very wary about people in suits, like people like Michael Saylor and the likes of them, institutional you know, people who, who they think are here to co-op Bitcoin. And what are your thoughts about the Bitcoin Mining Council? Are you guys part of it? Because I cannot see you guys in the you know, list of partners on the website. So what's, what do you have to say? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have particularly strong thoughts or opinions on the Bitcoin Mining Council. Um, I kind of remember watching it all unfold. I think it was back in May of last year, right? It was when it first came out. Um, I think it was in Mexico at the time. And seeing like this huge reaction you 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 just mentioned of um, you know, a lot of people saying this would be very good for the industry because of all the things like data disclosures for energy mixes and things like that, and then having a a uh, strong interest group to lobby for the interests of Bitcoin miners in. America, the United States. And then you have a lot of people on the other side saying it was not such a good thing for some of the reasons you mentioned, you know, historical events of people coming together behind closed doors, uh, like the, the block size wars, um, Segwit 2X, and saying that this is a, just a form of centralization. Um, these, this organization could potentially get enough influence to force other large miners to join it into the, until there's a point where like all the North American miners are in it and it can then thus exert some level of undue influence over them. Um, uh, as far as why we're not a part of it, it's just one, you know, we don't really have huge mining operations ourselves. We're focused on the pool and the software that runs on the devices. You know, it's not like we have warehouses full of devices that make us a huge miner. So, um, and a large, a large reason to create this was to disclose energy mix and to fight this huge energy FUD you constantly see about Bitcoin mining. And as a pool provider and operator, you know, we don't actually consume <laughs> that much electricity. It's a very, very minuscule amount, you know, just like the servers that are kind of scattered across the globe that take in some of this hash rate, which there really aren't that many. There's I don't know, like 20 or 30. Um, so our, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are individuals with a couple of yachts or something that produce more emissions than, than our entire company does. Um, so uh, there's that. And I mean, it, speaking perfectly honestly, and this will probably frustrate some people in the Bitcoin Mining Council that I know and have personal relationships with, it just I mean, it wasn't on our radar. We, we didn't even think, it wasn't like a strategy move. We didn't even think about it all. It's like, oh, that's a thing now. That's interesting to see everyone react to it. Uh, let's carry on developing our software. Uh, it wasn't really something um, that we put a lot of thought into, just to be completely honest. Blockstream has like a mining certificate. It's like a financial instrument that's backed by mining. Um, what's your opinion on that? And do you think we'll see like a lot more uh, of that in the future? I think we will see more instruments like this in the future. I'll start there. Um, it's it's a easier entry point for certain organizations or institutions that maybe are used to, let's call it traditional finance. Um, and it's, I think, some of the early forms of uh, what we'll begin to see maybe in the next couple of years in terms of uh, hash rate based financial instruments. This is just like a very straightforward contract. And because it's Blockstream and because it's probably all KYC and things like that, it makes it uh, much easier for, say, large investment funds that have certain hoops they need to jump through regulatory hoops to actually participate in mining and get exposure to hash rate without uh, any of the perceived risks associated with it. And then of course, there's just like the logistical or like operational risks of like, if you don't know much about mining and you try to leap into it and build big warehouses, source all the hardware, find all the expertise, it's something that takes an incredible amount of time. You'll probably experience a lot of hiccups and uh, you know fall down a lot along the way. So this is like a very simple, straightforward way for some of these entities to get exposure to mining without having to spend years learning the space, getting everything set up. 
Um, you know, if you have a partner like Blockstream to give you this exposure, they're already experts, they already mine, they already have hosting facilities and services. It's kind of just like a, a one-stop shop, you know, turnkey solution for them or whatever, whatever you'd call that. And um, so I guess my opinion on it is it's useful for very specific organizations to get Bitcoin mining exposure. Um, and yes, we'll see more stuff like it in the future. And um, yeah, very, very excited about some of the stuff Blockstream is doing moving forward in terms of Bitcoin mining. I think they'll become an increasingly bigger player moving forward and we'll see a lot more of them. Well, uh, I think the, I mean, we're running close ish to an hour. I don't know if the other guys have any questions left, but um, I feel like I know that if I run into a couple million and I decide I'm going to do mining, uh, Edward, you're the guy I'm going to come and have a chat to. Think, yeah. <laughs> you don't need a couple million, I promise. Um, you can, uh, I'm sure you could, you could do it for less than a couple grand in Brazil. I know if you find a supplier somewhere in one of those neighboring countries, you can get a Ant Miner S9 for, you know, 400 bucks, 300 bucks or something. And, kind of have at it. And at the very least, you know, I, I guess in that part of the world, this won't be a problem. But what's also becoming increasingly popular for the old gen machines like the S9 is to use them as space heaters because they do produce a decent amount of heat. So people just put them on like the lowest settings with our software, uh, put the fans as low as possible so they're quiet. And then effectively, even though you're not mining Bitcoin super profitably, the Bitcoin you do mine uh, is, um, you know, working against your electricity bill enough to where you can essentially acquire some sats and also heat your home. So not a, not a bad pet project if you're into it. Genius. Pretty genius. There's, there's gotta be like a way as well. Like, uh, I'm sure people have, I reckon in the future we'll have people making like uh, specific like, sort of devices designed to be heaters that happen to mine Bitcoin or like, have like a, you know, ima imagine if you can mine your Bitcoin on a mobile phone in the future or something, then it will be like a, you have like a, a heater setting or something where you turn it on and it, it heats your hands it warms your hands whilst mining at the same time or something <laughs> um or even gamers can you know I, I can see it happening like that but that'd be pretty cool um, there are some bitcoin space heaters hitting the market so keep an eye out for them i will do exactly that i did i did have one last question um can you talk a little bit about brains os yeah sure um I'm always happy to speak about one of our magnificent products that we put so much time and effort into uh, developing. So where to begin? Um, the project started uh, some years ago now, and it was kind of in response to some of the stuff that had happened with some of the hardware manufacturers, specifically Covert, ASIC Boost, and Amplead. Um, these are some major issues because Amplead was basically, Bitmain had the ability to shut off machines remotely, which wasn't good, which they, patched after it was made public. And then uh, there was some evidence that they were mining using covert ASIC boost um, uh, more profitably and like also not including it on the hardware they actually sold to some of their clients. Um, we also, when we published the first like major public version of Brains OS included over ASIC boost. And then of course they added it to their software afterwards. And so it kind of highlighted some issues in the industry with um, you know, you could buy these machines and they're yours. They're in your possession. You own them, you run them, but you don't necessarily dictate or control to any extent the software that was running on it. So in kind of the spirit of not your keys, not your coins, we kind of adopted not your firmware, not your miner. And then the open source project, uh, open source free version was plugging along for a while, supported on S9s and some of the, the Dragon Mints as well. And then what we did is there's basically a business opportunity for this as well. So we created Brains OS Plus, which is a version that has um, some of our auto-tuning algorithms, which uh, adjusts the voltage and frequencies on a per chip basis on these hash boards. And the simplest way to put it is what it does is for every watt of energy consumed by the machine, it optimizes hash rate output. So on software straight out of the manufacturer, using an S9, for example, say it runs 1,200 watts and produces 13.5 terahash. Um, you know, if you were to run the machine on Brains OS Plus at 1,200 watts, it would produce, you know, over 14 terahash. Um, so you're getting more, you're mining more efficiently and more profit, profitably. That's like the main value proposition. And of course, there's all these other features like some of the ones I mentioned before uh, that were sort of born of learning more about what miners need and some of the challenges they faced. 
uh, there's a preheat function because they don't do these hardware devices don't do so well in like sub-zero climates. So you know if you're mining in Siberia, you're going to have issues starting up your machines in the winter because they're so cold. What it does is it heats up the boards enough to the point where you can start hashing, you know, start mining. So if it's negative 20, negative 30 degrees, you don't need to worry about if you're going to be able to turn on your machine or not. You'll be able to. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're mining in like crazy hot environments, there's something referred to as dynamic power scaling, where you set a dangerous temperature range. And if the machine goes into that dangerous temperature range, it'll start stepping down the power in 100 watt intervals until it reaches a safe temperature range that you've predetermined, increasing the efficiency as it goes along. Because the less power a machine consumes with the software, uh, it can optimize for efficiency over raw hash rate output. So um, it kind of, that's you know started as a response to some of the major issues we saw in the mining industry in regards to people having no control whatsoever over the software that was running on their devices. And now it's sort of morphed over time into one of our main uh, business lines that people seem to love and um, is definitely my favorite product that we make. It's just super cool what you can do with the software. Um, and it's also really surprising that the manufacturers don't offer something like this for their, their clients because there is such a demand for it. Like you have to buy these things called fan spoofers and plug them into each individual machines if you do want to submerge them in oil and do immersion cooling. But you know, with third-party software like ours, you just toggle an option in the menu and you can sum, you can submerge the machines in oil, no problem. So it just makes everything simpler and um, for, for these larger operations that do have all these different operational needs because there is no one size fits all approach for mining. You know, some people are mining near the desert. Some people are mining in Siberia, as I said, some people need to immerse it because they're in Paraguay and there's all this dust uh, flying around, which is pretty uh, dangerous for the machines. You know, the three machine killers are uh, moisture, heat, and dust, probably. Uh, in terms of uh, if they have, they get on the chips, you're kind of screwed long term. So yeah, it's basically software that runs directly on the devices that allows you to operate in various forms of, uh, in various environments efficiently and profitably as well as gives you a little bit more control over the software that's actually running in your device. It is weird that they're, they're shipping without software like this, uh, like you said. Maybe we'll see uh, you know, someone like Bitmain trying to buy brains in the future. You never know. Uh, <laughs> could, uh, could, it, could be in the, it could be in the cards. <laughs> uh, uh, I, well, that would be flattering. I'm not sure we would ever, uh, we would ever go down that road. <laughs> entertain it, yeah. No, of course. I get you. Um, well, hey, um, Edward, appreciate you coming on. It's been a, a pleasure uh, to talk to you and I uh, appreciate uh, how I've learned a lot just from the conversation. So I'm sure people listening have as well. Um, so yeah, I appreciate it. Is there anything you wanted to say, like any final words like where people can find you and or anything like that or at all? Um, I guess I'll just finish with like a big thank you from me on Lawrence, Jerry, Ricardo. Um, this is the first time I'm meeting you guys. It was a fun conversation. Um, it's pretty high level because we had to cover a lot of big topics, but who knows, maybe in the future, we'll be able to dive into the nitty gritty specifics. And um, in terms of where to find me, uh, maybe just keep it in the beginning company focused, go to brains.com with two eyes. If you ever want to figure out what we do, um, all the different stuff we offer, B-R-A-I-I-N-S.com. Um, we have all our information there. It's a beautiful website, put a lot of work into it. So should ask, answer all your questions. And then for me personally, um, you know, if you're ever in Prague, you want to have a Pilsner or something, just hit me up on Twitter. Um, I'm at will hash number four coins, will hash four coins. And yeah, I'm pretty much always around to chat Bitcoin mining and I love this stuff. That's about it for me. Awesome. No, cheers. I'll, uh, I'll definitely make sure to drop you a DM if I'm in Prague at any point. Uh, it's a nice place. So uh, I'll let you know. Good food, well priced, priced, very good beer. Um, well, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for Joe for, for joining us as well. Anyone listening, thank you so much. We hope you've appreciated it and uh, have an amazing uh, day, week, month, year. Uh, stay happy, love life, and uh, keep buying Bitcoin and take care. Cheers, gentlemen.